Highlights Podcast. Kyle here with Jeremiah, fresh back from Baltimore Comic Con. Be back. Still has that Baltimore air. Sadly, I couldn't be there, but gladly you were there to give us some coverage of the convention. We'll start with that. If you haven't been on TikTok, go on TikTok. We have some quick interviews with a few really cool people if you want to talk about them real quick. We went and saw Terry Morgan. We talked with Trish and Tony talking about stray dogs. Interviewed my hero and the whole reason I became obsessed with comics, Bob Hall, and also Dennis Robinson. I had a few more interviews lined up. Everyone was just a little too busy, even though I did get in a little bit early. They're like, come back Sunday, come back Sunday. And it's either they didn't show up on Sunday. This show was wonderful. Baltimore is always a wonderful show, but it was exciting exhausting <laughs> in a way that i haven't had a, a, a con be in a long time and it beat up the creators just an exhausting show on sunday everyone was a little worn out seeing terry again he loved the hat that was really fun so i know with new york it was super hectic and i was just bombarding people and kind of putting them on the spot in the sense of i have everything out and ready to go this is for you this is promoting how many fuck offs did you get six or seven but because it was baltimore they didn't just straight up say fuck off they said hey we can do this if we find the time either come to me early or come to me late terry dotson was one of those people he was more than willing to but he always was super busy and so we were going to do it late in the day and he is essential sequential so his rep wasn't too happy about it vetoed the whole thing yeah, it's hit or miss, I've found, with conventions now that we've been trying to do this, but anything is better than nothing. Followers on TikTok absolutely love it. I think it's worth trying, for sure. See, my interview style is different from yours and Dimitri's and maybe Pierre's, because I do a lot of research into the creator beforehand, just because I want to hit them with some off-the-cuff questions. I got to ask one of the off-the-cuff questions. Unfortunately, it wasn't recording at the time just because Ron Garney was pretty busy. But I told him, I was like, I find it funny to ask creators what their first published work was because the majority of the time they don't remember. And he's like, oh, I remember. And I was like, well, with you, it's difficult because you had two books come out the same week like the same exact day for your first work. And he's like, G.I. Joe was the first thing I worked on. So he did G.I. Joe one time. Wasn't happy about it, apparently. But I think it's just because he's grown as an artist so much. I wanted to ask Terry Dotson, but Terry Dotson had no idea what his first work was. And that's about the time his rep came over. And Terry Dotson's first work is Rock and Roll Comics number 38, Rod Stewart. He inked that issue back in 1991. So yeah, that was one of the things that... I went into with the goal of interviewing Terry again was just Terry wasn't busy and I was purchasing books from Terry. So I was like, hey, let me stick a microphone in your face. Interviewing Bob Hall was big for me just because Bob Hall is one of the reasons I became obsessed with comics. For those of you who aren't aware, I did have a published story a few years ago in an anthology called It Was Metal and Bob was the penciler an inker for my story, my 10 page story called Phantom Flight that I also wrote with Josh Schwartz and was colored by my best friend, Rachel Persephone. But yeah, Bob did the pencils and inks for that. So it was really cool to talk to him about that and just talk to him about comics in general. We had a longer conversation that wasn't recorded. And like one of my biggest fears when talking to a creator, especially someone that I idolize so much is what if they're a dick? It's just going to crush me. When I met Paulo for the first time, I couldn't do it without Maria next to me because I was terrified that he was going to be a jerk. But he clearly isn't. Yeah, that's always a fear of mine. I like your style. And the reason I haven't done your style is because the first time I tried this, I got many fuck-offs. And they were in the sense of, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And what do you expect me to say? So from there, especially when New York is so hectic, my pitch was, I just want to get you one question and then promote what you're doing. It's literally under 60 seconds on purpose because that's what thrives on TikTok. Now in Baltimore, I was hoping you had a more relaxed and you did, but Baltimore is obviously becoming more and more popular. Yeah. Just from the people I've talked to and I've interviewed, everyone's like, oh, you're going to Baltimore, right? It is blowing up. I understand why you mm-hmm. might've struggled with your technique. I mean, you got some great ones. But it's not easy. And I think that's why no one does it. And I think that's why we're going to keep doing it as much as we can. I think what we did with the film and dump is what we're going to do moving on. Oh, yeah. That worked so well. Yeah. That's the problem when I do them. There's no one for me to dump it to. True. Yeah, that's your problem. (laughs) To, like, teach somebody. (laughs) It really worked. And, I mean, you were giving me three-minute videos, and I cut them down in a minute. That was the goal. Go a little bit longer so you'd be able to cut 
it's just funny because I'm like, he's really trying to get real interviews here. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I had so much trouble getting one minute, just two questions, but you pulled it off. Getting in early is great because you can get with the creators a little bit before they're super busy. Interviewing creators is always a great thing to do. I love when we have our deep dives on the actual podcast, but doing it at cons, getting one or two minute interviews with them is always just absolute fun. And I want to keep doing it. And I'm glad that we're going to keep going down that path. The nerves, though. Again, there's that fear, like, if I fuck up, if I seem like a jerk to this person, they're not going to give me shit. But going into it, instead of just asking them what the latest or newest thing is, bringing up something old, I feel sometimes endears you a little bit to them. One of the questions I was going to ask Ron Garney, he designed a lot of costumes. He designed the Iron Spider costume. He designed Daredevil's black suit that will most likely be used in Spider-Man freshman year. I was going to ask him which one of them is his favorite and which one does he like the adaptation of better. But someone didn't show up on Sunday. Besides the interviews, which again, I think you did fantastic. Who else did you talk to? Tell me some signatures you got. Even if it's more personal stuff, you know, the convention's not all you doing my dirty work. I really desperately wanted to get as many signatures as I could on my Daredevil 1.50, which is a Polar Vera cover that has 158 Daredevil creators' names on it. Everyone knows the Amazing Spider-Man 700 Skyline variant that has every creator that has worked on Spider-Man. This is the Daredevil equivalent, and I feel it's much better because it's not a boring Skyline. <laughs> it makes it for a little bit more difficult of a signature hunt, I guess but I find it way cooler and I got nine could have got 10 but I did not get Frank Miller your boy spent too much money and that line was very long I don't do great in lines I like talking with creators and spending time with creators but I don't do great in lines and I don't want to wait for half the con which is why if you want to you can use Desert Wind Alan Davis I did not expect him to be so popular and it's mainly because he's very rare at shows and he draws constantly at shows so his signings are specific times and if you're not in line you will get capped out i ended up waiting like an hour and a half for him that was the longest i waited because i desperately needed my miracle man sign <laughs> but yeah getting alan davis's signature some people who usually charge for signatures saw what i was doing and would not charge me they would not take my money which is very nice of them but i spent more on signatures than i did on books at this show which is something i've never done before i do got to give our friends at desert win a shout out they are helping me out big time with the book that I didn't think I'd get the opportunity for. They are doing a private signing with Sal Buscema, and Sal is a legend in the industry, but he also was the inker on Superior Spider-Man Team Up 11 and 12 for the backup story, which is a connecting cover Paula Rivera variants. So I'm having him sign across the two covers, similar to how Brian Starfleet did. Ridiculous. <laughs> which I'm super excited to see how that turns out. But yeah, fun show to get to talk to creators. I got to chat with Brian Starfleet for a little bit, Jim Star Starlin. I got to hear stories when I was in line writing for him, but it wasn't super long. It was like five minutes, but it was interesting to hear what he had to say about specific things like the Adam Warlock casting and so on. There was a lot of great vendors as well. A lot of books you never see at shows. It really shows that collecting comics is transitioning big time, especially since the pandemic. A lot of vendors had, I don't want to call them like your standard run-of-the-mill books, but that's really what it was for the last couple of years. And then the pandemic, I think, because we all had to stay home and everyone's collecting mentality either changed or blossomed within that time period. A lot more vendors took bigger risks with the books that they brought to try to hit more niche markets. And it paid off for a lot of vendors. Almost every vendor I talked to said it was a great show. And just like every other show, Friday was tough going. Saturday was balls to the wall and Sunday was amazing. Friday was great for me. I almost finished all my signatures on Friday. The only one I didn't get was Alan Davis. That's the only one I didn't get on Friday. I won prizes at CGC. Tell us about that. I, CGC had this thing where if you take a picture with a booth, you get to reach in and pull out a pin. And that's what I thought the end of it was. I walked up to ask for my pin and like seven people all at the same time were like, how do we get a pin? How do we get a pin? So the guy was explaining and he held out the bag. And they all did theirs and we cracked it and I pulled a 9.9. .9. It's beautiful gold, looks just like the actual grade. And I thought, cool, I have a new pin. No, I got a free hoodie or t-shirt. I chose the hoodie. Thank God, because I did not pack warm for Baltimore and it was colder than I was expecting. <laughs> and I got a tote bag. 
all for just taking a picture at the CGC booth. The guy next to me was super upset that he pulled a 9.8 and like threw it at the CGC guy. So I asked if I could have that one too. So I got a 9.8 as well. I also got a free t-shirt from Shortbox and was featured on their social media post, which made me happy. The guy asked me if I take a picture. I said, sure. Can I take a picture with the LV Cole covers? Which is why I'm gesturing to the LV Cole covers. That was a lot of fun. And I chatted with them for a long time. What Shortbox is doing is great for or collectors and sellers because now they've implemented the new fair market value grader without even clicking on the book you can tell right away if they're charging a premium if it's a good price or if it's not worth buying at all before even clicking on the book to see how many is in the census or whatnot because they're already tracking the fair market value obviously some niche titles they're not going to have fair market value strictly because how rarely they sell but overall like your standard books They track them very, very well. The way that they handle shipping, the way they handle customer service, Shorebox is doing it well and they're very successful at it. And there's a reason. You were mentioning spending money on signatures and you spent more than ever before on signatures. What else did you buy outside of signatures? Inadvertently, I finished a EC Comics run. I had four issues of EC's piracy, and there was only three issues left. And like, you never really see EC's. If you do see them, you see them at Baltimore. And this one guy had a box the only two issues in that box were two that I was missing. So, oh, cool. I'll buy these, I guess, which I dropped a hundred bucks on because they were 50 a piece. And then randomly in a random box, completely out of order at another vendor had the final issue I was missing, which no other vendor had because I was just like, I'm only missing one. I'll go peruse around, see if anyone's got it. And no one else had it. And it was just randomly in the back of a box. So that worked out too. And that one was 20 bucks. I spent $220 on just signatures. And I think I spent $180 on comics it's fair i haven't gone through long boxes at a convention in probably seven eight maybe more years i come prepared there's nothing i'm looking for that i didn't already buy because i'm buying it because someone's there that i need that signature you don't buy random shit everything you buy is with a purpose i have not a miracle man issue i have a marvel man issue from 1959 that i randomly found never saw that before yeah i couldn't believe it was there either because i collect such weird and random shit i love digging through short boxes and long boxes i give you credit i mean either it's brand new and i fell in love with it and i have to have every part of it or it's something i fell in love with a while ago and i'm continuing to pick up every part of it for speculation so do you have every batman beyond variant from back in the day yes the only ones i'm missing are foreign ones there's three they go about a hundred a pop don't bring in foreigns with the rivera even though i have hunted foreigns in the rivera <laughs> i mean my logic though is if the cover is different it's worth grabbing yes i'm right there with you if the, if the cover is different go for it if the cover is exactly the same, don't bother. And there bother. are three unique covers for those. So in time, I will grab them. That's not pressing for sure. Like I have like an Italian Venom variant because it was the only Chrome cover they did. Like stuff like that. But a lot of stuff I buy too is simply off first appearance, just being a fan of the character. Mm-hmm. I know I'm not going to collect or read it all in my life. So I grab the first and that makes me feel good. And then some is obviously speculation that I'll say I'm going to sell and then I have a connection to it and I want to keep it. A fun thing about digging through long boxes in, at the con was I purposely didn't bring Iron Man number 63, which is Paul Rivera's first cover ever, mm. even though the writer of that book, Mike Grell, was at the con. And so I told myself, I'll look for it. And if I find it at the con, it's going to be $5 at most because it's not a valuable book at all. I'll spend the $5 and I'll get it signed by Mike Grell. And so I found the only booth where that book would even be a thing. And he had the entire run missing that issue. Oh. So I found that hilarious. So you did some dicking, you did some interviews. How about panels? Did you make any appearances in any panels? I know you're doing quizzes and other conventions that are upcoming. So Yeah, I'm hosting trivia at an upcoming convention, my local convention, the one that I help participate and plan with. But as for the panels, I didn't do many in the panels, but I do have to say this was a really tough year. And the fact that there were four panels in a row that were in memoriam panels. 
So there was a panel about George Perez, Neil Adams, Tim Sale, and Tom Palmer, all who we've lost within this last year, and all of which who are previous guests at Baltimore, most of them multiple times. Neil Adams always would be at Baltimore, same with Tom Palmer. Tim Sale would show up every few years, and so would George Perez. All four of those creators had a cult following to begin with, but they had really good connections with that convention. So it was really tough to see that on the docket. I was helping Rachel a lot so I didn't do much in the way of panels. I did see some cool cosplays. There's a really good spawn you can probably find photos and TikToks of. I ran into a few TikTokers. Comic Concierge. We talked for a bit. He's a cool dude. He had one of the most complete yearbooks that I've seen, which was really awesome. And for those of you not aware, Baltimore, every year they do a character yearbook. So they will pick a character. In years past, there was Frank Cho's Liberty Meadows, a Terry Moore's Strangers in Paradise. This year was Jill Thompson's Scary Godmother, which is a fantastic series. And so they'll get a bunch of artists to do their version of it, put it in a yearbook. And then if you buy the yearbook, you can go around and try to get them all signed and it comes with like a checklist as well rachel participated in that this year her original her original was sold 50 percent of the proceeds went to baltimore comic-con and oh. the other 50 percent went to the hero initiative yeah some of the yearbook paintings were really 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 nice this year for scary godmother why don't you promote Rachel real quick? Rachel Persephone, happy birthday. Today is your birthday today that we are recording this. She is one of my best friends. I've known her for a very, very, very long time. She does traditional illustration with digital painting over it occasionally, but sometimes just straight up original painting. She has just released a new piece for her Endless series, Destiny, we saw for the first time at Baltimore, as well as I think this was also the first showing of Death from the Endless, which looks a bit like this. Oh, wow, okay. Very cool. Rachel is fantastic. You can find her at The Art of Rachel Persephone on Facebook and Rachel Persephone on Instagram. She also has her own website. So if you're looking for cover illustrations, hit her up. She's always looking at clients if she's not super busy. She had a lot of inquiries about future work, which is great to see at the show. And the great thing about Rachel, and if I doubt she'll listen to this, but Absolutely. with her being at Baltimore, I don't need a pack mule wife. I can just drop stuff at someone's table and move on. <laughs> it's one of the yeah. best. Wow. Yeah, I can just dump stuff at a table and not have to worry about it. So you were just living it there. You had a table oh, yeah. you could go to. I had a press pass, come in early, stay a little late. No one's going to bother me. Yeah, absolute great show. Any other stories you'd like to share that stuck out to you? Uh, Vendor, he asked if I was looking for anything. I was like, you probably don't have it. He said, you don't know if you don't ask. So we got to chatting and he's like, do you know what this is? Because I was mentioning a lot of random books and he handed me a random book and it was a Shadowhawk number one glow in the dark but it was a misprint. They didn't print the inks on the cover. So it was just white with the glow in the dark film on top. And I was like, oh, I actually know what that is. No one's ever guessed it right. And I was like, oh yeah, there's only five in existence though. It's like super, super rare. He had a $5,000 price sticker on it because he's never seen one before. And he's just like, so how much do I sell it for? I was like, you can name your price because there's only 5000 But it blew right. his mind that I knew exactly what it was, wow. <laughs> which is okay. really funny. Mike McKinn refused to take my money because he saw that I was trying to do the jam piece. Same with Cully Hamner. He refused to take my money because I was trying to do the jam piece. Exhausting on day three. I don't know if it's the concrete floors. With New York, there's escalators, there's stairs, there's the showroom, there's the artist alley. Baltimore, it's all one big room on the mm. same level. So I don't know if that was a part of it either. I don't know, but man, it, it was fun, but it was exhausting. You haven't done New York in how many years now? Six years. It is more intense than it was and what you remember. Oh, I can imagine. So I guess my question is, I'm curious of the vibe of Baltimore. Do you feel like it's leaning more towards the New York you remember? And New York has gone one step farther, a higher tier of just evil? I don't think so. Only because Baltimore does a great job in keeping the focus on comics. They do have celebrity guests, but the celebrity guests were five voice actors and Johnny Leguizamo. Having the big opportunity to meet movie stars and TV stars at New York will always be the allure of New York. And New York may go a lot further in that entertainment direction, whether it be video games, whether it be TV shows, whether it be movies, and kind of comic just in name alone, because because it encompasses so much culture, whereas Baltimore will still keep comic at the core. There will still be more vendors than exhibitors, always. 
I feel. Comics, Cards, and Collectibles is the showrunner for that show. They have a store out of Frederick, Maryland. Wonderful store, wonderful guys. And they want to keep comics at the forefront for sure, which is why they shell out so much money for Jim Lee and Frank Miller to show up. I feel as though it's beginning a lot more popular for multiple reasons. One, people are realizing how great of a town Baltimore is and how easy it is to get to and from the con. Like, hotel rooms in New York City near Javits is what six seven hundred dollars a night during the con Mm -hmm. i stayed literally across the street from the convention center for two hundred dollars a night that was bad parking for the three days cost me 60 bucks and that's a day in new york yeah yeah exactly so i think it's catching popularity because of that it's getting busier for sure it gets bigger pretty much every year i don't think it will ever reach the levels of new york but we are talking about the current fourth biggest show on the east coast and so i can clearly see it taking the third or second spot eventually yeah i mean that's obviously a concern i mean i have to say new york especially this year felt like it had way more comic stuff than it did the years prior and i think it was because of covid too good and that was my fear but i think covid hurt it in the sense where new york was already getting that line of there's too much other stuff outside of comic books that it's not like an equal balance and then when covid you know is now under control for the lack of better words the whole thing is full again artist alley is packed again so it's everything plus everything plus everything i didn't feel like this new york was missing anything when i remember baltimore from last year being like holy shit how is there this many creators i guess my point is there's some competition to be had because new york stepped up and i feel baltimore continues to move stronger along yeah the other thing that i really love about baltimore is what a close connection it has to the hero initiative and for those of you who aren't aware the hero initiative is a non-profit company that helps creators in need a lot of comics creators don't have health insurance so the hero initiative steps in and helps out with medical bills or or even sometimes groceries and stuff. I always donate to the Hero Initiative whenever I have an opportunity. So if you can, quote unquote, be a hero, that's their slogan. And they do such a great job with Baltimore bringing in great creators. Last year, you had Christopher Priest sign your books. Yes, yes, I did. So again, Hero Initiative bringing in Christopher Priest. They brought in Anna Senti this year, who's a fantastic writer, who had an amazing run on Daredevil. They brought in your uncle's friend, Fabian, which he was a lot of fun to chat with for a bit. He has this really big signal signature and i was trying to get him on that jam piece Mm -hmm. and so he signed super small and then i had another book for him to sign and i made the window box super big and he filled the whole thing because i made the comment of how he signs big so it was really funny but I think you would have enjoyed it, and there's always next year. It didn't move up next year, though. It's before New York next year, which is interesting. That could help. That was yeah. part of the problem, too. It was so close so to another close. convention. And surprise, surprise, this podcast doesn't pay the bills. Not yet. Yeah. We're working on it. I have deadline. Uh, yeah, it's September 8th, 9th, and 10th next year. Almost two-month jump. And that gives a month before New York uh-huh okay that's something we could talk about all right yeah fantastic show can't wait for the next one and in my eyes in my eyes because we are east coast to me baltimore is the end of con season usually because it's usually towards the end of october so i see that as winter is coming <laughs> once baltimore has happened winter is coming right. in my opinion i'm sad i missed it you handled it well uh, thank you baltimore for allowing us to be there i hope we did you proud and panelies podcast Johnny Leguizamo kind of yelled at a guy because for no reason, Johnny Leguizamo was walking past him and he's just like, wow, I'm taller than Johnny Leguizamo. Johnny Leguizamo turned around and started yelling. So that was fun. Random. That was fun to witness. A nice podcast. Dude, it was exhausting, man. Yeah. I don't know why. It's just funny because I was like, he's seen me do the interviews. Let him fucking do them. Because I knew the mental drain on trying to present yourself. And that's why I don't put myself in the camera. Then I'm worried about how I look on top of the fact of not stuttering and stumbling and sounding like an idiot. I was ready for you to get beat the fuck down by that. On this podcast. So the worst interview was also kind of the best. Terry Moore. He was fine. Mm-hmm. Talking to him was great. I was in a full-on panic because if you watch that interview, my badge is missing. Oh, really? Yeah, it disappeared. No idea where it went. And I found out the moment before we hit record. 
So the whole time I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get back into the con tomorrow. I better find this fucking badge. Turned out it was like right around the corner. It just came unclipped. Nice podcast. We found a badge at Shake Shack. Oh, really? Yeah, someone's pro badge was at Shake Shack. And so we took it back to the hotel room. I found them on Facebook. I messaged them. No response. I dropped it off at guest services. And about halfway through Sunday, I went over to their table. And they're sitting there. And I was like, do you have your badge? And they're like, no, I'm using a fake one. Well, it's at guest services. You're a hero. 